when lifted into consciousness, the same forces that shape our bodies become geometry. Within their complexity, certain tendencies are evident. The ellipse, including the circle, is easy to survey, lying as it does entirely within the finite. Hence our earthly, rational mind feels comfortable with it. The hyperbola passes through the infinite distance, surpassing our ordinary consciousness. As Ernst Bindel noted, the ellipse resonates with the calm repose of the human head. The hyperbola with the kinetic energy of the limbs. An ellipse, infinitely contracted, becomes a point. An hyperbola, infinitely expanded, becomes a line. The rib cage mediates between the extremes changing rhythmically from circle to ellipse to parabola. The head, with its exoskeletal tendency, can be understood as a limb system turned inside out. Following a recommendation by Rudolf Steiner, we attempt to understand the metamorphosis of the long bones to the skull between incarnations by means of exact morphology. This means transforming a one-sheet hyperboloid to a sphere. A two-sheet hyperboloid can be transformed projectively to a sphere or an ellipsoid. So can a one-sheet hyperboloid, but only by way of the invisible, namely by degeneration or by the imaginary. This is usually done algebraically. For instance, a non-degenerating transformation from the one-sheet hyperboloid x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals one to the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1 can be given by this equation, where the coefficient u varies from i to 1 as t increases from 0 to 1. Louis Locher Ernst found a geometric presentation by way of imaginary surfaces, later elaborated upon by Arnold Bernhardt. We can use this notation. The arrow denotes an imaginary point, beginning at the center of density, extending half the amplitude and showing the direction of movement. The arc denotes half the amplitude of an imaginary line, the colors showing the direction of rotation from the axis of density, here turquoise, to the darker blue boundary of the amplitude. Here is a sphere with some of its imaginary currents. This two-dimensional image may be thought of as a section. Spatially, you have to think the amplitudes of these imaginary double points rotated sideways around the circle. That gives you a one-sheet hyperboloid as the underlying formative tendency of the long bones and a sphere as that of the skull.
we enhance the usual mental picture of a circle or a sphere to a dynamic process moving in all the lines and points of the plane. A visible point or line is in fact a degenerate imaginary one whose movement has shrunk to zero. The visible part of the circle or sphere is a product of congestion. The imaginary is less incarnated than the visible. It is the prior realm of movement out of which the forms congeal. That is where the transformation happens. In anthroposophical terms, the genesis descends through the second hierarchy, the idea is a manifestation of the spirits of wisdom. The currents it generates are a deed of the spirits of movement. The resulting visible shape is a work of the spirits of form. Here is a hyperbola with the movements of its imaginary double points indicated in blue. As always, jamming toward the visible part of the curve. In space, these are imaginary circles. When the hyperbola begins to excarnate, imaginary points, here red, lift out of the visible curve. The T of the equation is proportional to the movement of their centers of density from the curve to the major axis. At first, these new imaginary points move slowly, then faster. At the same time, the imaginary part of the former hyperbola begins to slow, its centers of density no longer identical in both directions. Halfway through the transformation, the amplitudes touch. Then they overlap. When the centers of density coincide, the imaginary points move in the involutions of a visible circle, which incarnates where the imaginary part of the former hyperbola has halted. This too can be polarized. Ready? Here is a hyperbola with the movements of its imaginary double lines indicated in blue. The axes of density are turquoise. The amplitude boundaries darker blue. As always, jamming toward the visible part of the curve. In space, these are imaginary cones. When the hyperbola begins to excarnate, imaginary lines lift out of the tangents. Their axes of density are shown in yellow, with the amplitude boundaries in red. The T of the equation is now proportional 
to the gradual rotation of their axes of density from the tangents to the major axis, as measured in terms of spread, that is, it is proportional to the eventual total change in the square of the sine. At first, these new imaginary lines rotate slowly, then faster. At the same time, the imaginary part of the former hyperbola begins to slow. Its axes of density no longer identical in both directions. Halfway through the transformation, the amplitudes touch. Then they overlap. When the axes of density coincide, the imaginary lines rotate in the involutions of a visible circle, which incarnates where the imaginary part of the former hyperbola has halted. As Bernhard notes, Healthy imaginations, appropriate to the present age, are no longer received passively as visions. We must develop them by our own inner activity. Projective morphology is a school of exact imagination. It arises by subjective effort, yet it reveals spiritual realities.